9, 1957, and it shows Dallas Cowboys owner Jerry Jones among a crowd of white students trying to keep black students from integrating at an Arkansas high school. This is a Washington Post reporting. It reports that Jones, who was 14 at the time, could be seen standing a few yards from where the six black students were being jostled and repelled with snarling racial slurs by ringleaders of the mob. So joining us now, sports and feature columnist at The Washington Post, Sally Jenkins. Uh, Sally broke this story along with her co-author, David Moranis. We're so happy that you could join us this morning. Thank you very much. Happy Thanksgiving to you. And again, I have to commend you on your reporting this whole Amazing. thing. Amazing. Is right? I mean, it's, it's, it's stunning. really stunning. It's fascinating. So, so let's start with the picture, <laughs> okay? And then we'll talk about, you know, how we could have sort of moved diversity along with coaching in the NFL and, and in sports. Let's start with this photograph, though. What did, what, did you, what did you learn about this from this photograph? Well, I think the first thing you learn is, is just how uh, widespread the segregationists were in Little Rock and North Little Rock. Jerry Jones's high school was North Little Rock, which was across the Arkansas River from Central High School, which is the school that got all of the attention when uh, Eisenhower sent in federal troops to protect the Little Rock Nine at that school over there. But the segregationist agitators were actually very active on both sites. And the fact that uh, we knew that generationally, Jerry Jones had to have experienced the events in Little Rock more generally, but to find him in the photograph and, and to learn that he experienced one of those incidents right on the schoolhouse steps was pretty revelatory. We were blown away, uh, to put it mildly. Let me ask you about this picture just quickly here, because he is saying, he's using, saying, you know, I was just there. I wasn't participating. I was there just sort of to uh, observe. Um, but the, with the photograph, what you, guys, what you point out in your reporting is that in order to get where he was at the top of those stairs, that he had to get up there pretty quickly, and those were sort of the students that were keeping the, um, the black students from entering. Does this say anything about his participation? Are you making any sort of judgment about it, or...? Uh, no, I, well, I, two things. First of all, uh, uh, he, he's a little old at the time, so he's actually younger than the ringleaders that you can see in the photographs. That's one thing that we noticed. We did look at a sequence of photos leading up to those schoolhouse steps, and the white teenagers on the steps did have to move around the black students to get to the top of the steps. Nevertheless, he is uh, further back. He is younger than the lead participants. And so I think that, you know, you simply have to take him at his word unless something else appears, that he was there more out of curiosity and fascination uh, as opposed to being really at the very epicenter of, of the active events. It, he does remember, one thing he told us that did not make it in the story is that he does remember that it got physical. Uh, oh. the, the tough guys that you see in the center of the photograph end up really pushing uh, the kids down off the steps. Mm. Um, and in fact, one of them is arrested. I hope uh, everyone takes a moment to read the reporting that uh, that you and David did as they watch football, because the reason you did this is not just about that photo. It's about what it means with his position of power in the league now and the NFL now and the position of power the Cowboys have. Right. And this is part of what The Washington Post is doing, examining the NFL's, as you guys call, decades long failure to equitably promote black coaches. Right. And uh, and yes. I'm go ahead. Uh, well, this story is part of a long uh, series we've been doing called Blackout, which is examining the issues in the league about the, the fact that almost 70 percent of the workforce is black, and yet uh, there are only three head coaches. One of the things our data has found is that mid-level uh, black coaches who do manage to get head coaching jobs waited an average of nine years longer in mid-level assistant coaching jobs than their white counterparts. So there's some very striking inequities within the league, as I, the league admits. And by the way, Jerry Jones was the only owner to talk to us for this uh, series in any in-depth way. We give him a lot of credit for sitting down and having this very difficult conversation. Yeah, I'm glad. I'm glad you bring that up. Right, they all should have talked to you, by the way. But look, you, one of the uh, sportscasters, well-known retired sportscaster in Dallas, uh, Dale Hansen, said, "What frustrates me most is he." Meaning Jerry Jones is in such a position, such a leader, that if he would take a strong stance, he could be the force of change in the NFL. And it seems like from your reporting, um, Jones agrees that he could be the change maker here for the league. He did agree. And that was one of the more interesting uh, things in our conversation with him, which, which lasted well over two and a half hours. 
Uh, he said, I understand that. I agree with that. Uh, we discussed why he hadn't been at the forefront of this issue until now. Uh, and the short answer to that is that he's he's been more uh, concerned with trying to win, uh, you know, Super Bowls and appointing, you know, men who were old friends of his or that who he knew to the job. Uh, in a college uh, teammate of his, his second head coach was Barry Switzer, and again, a guy he went way back to Arkansas with. And so, you know, he's forthright in trying to address these these tough questions. It doesn't mean you'll always be satisfied by his answers. But again, he was one of the only owners, the only owner, to really sit down and talk to us uh, to this extent about it. All right, so you have to give him some credit there. But I mean, listen, there were failures, and there, and there are failures in the NFL, as, you're, as this is uh, pointing out. So sure. then... What is, as you have been reporting this, again, Sally, it's great. Everyone should read this. It's fascinating. Um, so what's, what's the solution here? What, should, what do you think should be done? Well, I think one solution is, is the, the NFL has launched an inaugural accelerator program. It's not a solution. It's a, it's a tool. It's a mechanism to try to help owners get to know owners uh, more personally. What uh, a lot of times what they lack are the close personal relationships. Uh, you know, that's one thing we've heard. Uh, owners don't spend much time with them. Uh, you know, owners talk to lots of head coaches. They talk to very few uh, assistant coaches. If you're an owner of the New York Giants or the Dallas Cowboys, you're not, you're not probably spending a great deal of time talking to your running backs coach. So this accelerator program is one idea to try to get those relationships moving along. Uh, you know, I, I, we'll see if it, if it works. Quite frankly, a, a much better idea is for a team like the Dallas Cowboys, a real maker of manners, to hire a black head coach and to have a winning record or win a Super Bowl with one. When Tony Dungy was hired and won Super Bowls uh, with the Indianapolis Colts, it definitely did trigger a moment there where the NFL looked like it was going to become much, much more diverse in its head coaching ranks. And then, as our series reported, it actually moved backward. It constricted again. Yeah. Sally Jenkins uh, joins us, and David Moranis is also uh, the co-writer on it. It's, it's from the Washington Post. Jerry Jones helped transform the NFL, except when it comes to race. Again, it is fascinating uh, and in-depth read, and I think everyone should, uh, should check it out. Thank you. Happy Thanksgiving to you.